All right, I think we can get started now. So hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. This is our Arnold Arboretum Tree Mob about turtles and turtle conservation. And our speaker today is Matt Cam. He is a biologist educator with Zoo New England. He earned his doctorate in biology at Tufts University. And while much of his research has focused on birds, he now is focusing on um, reptiles and amphibians with Zoo New England's Grassroots Wildlife Conservation Program. So Matt is going to give us a little intro to turtles and then he is going to talk about the research project that he initiated with Brian Windmiller in the Arboretum's Landscape in July. We are recording this webinar and if you would ask the questions in the Q&A, then I will review those questions and feed those to Matt as we go. So take it away, Matt, and thank you to you and your team for being here today. Yeah, it's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you very much, Pam. And it's great to see, so to speak, see everybody coming out for this talk. Uh, I'm really excited. So yeah, hi, my name's Matt. Uh, I study turtles with uh, the conservation branch of Zoo New England. So Zoo New England does a lot of conservation all over the world associated with gorillas and other sort of endangered exciting animals that you see in zoos, but we also have a local conservation branch, uh, which is constantly growing and we're always starting new programs. And some of our most successful local conservation programs are focused on native turtles right here in Massachusetts. Uh, Massachusetts has a whole bunch of native turtle species, uh, some of which are a real conservation concern. There's Blanding's turtles, wood turtles, I do a lot of my field work on. Those are both state listed species um, that are vulnerable to decline for a whole bunch of reasons. But another thing that we've been interested in studying for a while is how turtles survive and thrive in urban landscapes. Um, and Arnold Arboretum is, is a wonderful sort of pocket of green, but it's very much centered in an urban landscape. Uh, and people have been telling us at the Arboretum for years that there's lots and lots of turtles. They see lots of snapping turtles. They see lots of painted turtles. There are always turtles crossing the roads. So we're interested to find out just how large this turtle population is, uh, how their health is, you know, how they're doing, what sort of the demography of the population is, so what the gender balance is, how often they're reproducing successfully, what the distribution of ages in the population is. All of those things are really useful to know to assess sort of the overall health of a wildlife population. So uh, Dr. Brian Windmiller, who's in charge of the conservation department, sort of uh, talked with the Arboretum folks and got this program started. Uh, and I'm the one who's sort of on the ground in the field, uh, doing a lot of the trapping, surveying, notching of turtles, um, as well as pond invertebrates, fish, amphibians. We're doing just sort of as comprehensive a survey as we can of the three different ponds at the Arboretum. Uh, so of the three ponds, um, Faxon, Raider, and Dawson, we, we've been interested to see just over the past couple of weeks while we've been trapping. Uh, Faxon has dried up almost completely. It's pretty much just mud now and Raider is not far behind. Uh, it's lost probably about half or more of the surface water that it had even when we just started trapping a week and a half ago. Um, and as that's been happening, we've actually already observed a lot of movements by turtles leaving Faxon and Raider and coming over to Dawson, the biggest pond. So we've got several turtles that we originally caught in one of those smaller ponds that we're now recapturing in our traps here in the larger pond. So the traps that we use are sort of a bunch of hoops put together with nets in between them uh, that have um, mouths that are held together by water pressure. We bait the traps with sardines. The, the smell of the sardines in a can really attracts turtles. So the turtles swim in through the mouth of the trap and then water pressure holds the mouth closed so the turtles can't swim back out. We check the traps every day. We take the turtles out, we measure them, we notch their shells, which is just like clipping their fingernails so it doesn't hurt them at all. But those notch patterns on their shells let us tell if we've caught the same individual again, which lets us see how large the population is. And then we let the turtles go. So overall, we try and make it as, as low stress and easy a process for them as we can. Um, and pretty much all of the turtles we've caught have been in good health. So we're not uh, very worried about them in that respect. Uh, so just this morning, I went out and I checked some of our traps here in Dawson, uh, along with Ashley, who's been working with me in the field. 
Um, and we've got a couple turtles to actually show you right here live on the call. So I'm just going to grab one of those right now. <laughs> so this is a painted turtle. Painted turtles are probably the most common, the most numerous turtle species in Massachusetts. They're called painted turtles because of these lovely vivid colors that they have. That bright yellow belly, those yellow and black stripes on their face, the bright red underneath the shell. Uh, it's really a, a wonderful pattern, like really charming, gorgeous. And even though these turtles are really common, they're still really striking. Uh, so a bit of sort of basic turtle biology for those of you who are interested. Turtles are reptiles, just like lizards and snakes. Um, they have shells. These shells show two different parts. So the back of the shell is what we call the carapace. And the belly or the stomach part of the shell is called the plastron. And you can see that in many, in most species even, those are connected right along the turtle's sides. And so you might have seen like in old cartoons, a turtle will like leave their shell and come out wearing their underpants or like they'll pull inside their shell and it's like a little house where they've got an armchair and like an end table. So real turtles cannot leave their shells. Their shells are part of their spinal structure. It's actually fused to their backbone. Uh, so some turtles can pull inside their shells if they're feeling scared. You can see she's not feeling terribly scared right now. She mostly just wants to go back in the water. So she's doing this kind of air swimming behavior with her legs and her arms trying to get away. Now this painted turtle is an adult. They do get bigger than this, but this is a pretty good sized adult, I would say. And she's a female, which I can tell for a couple of reasons. So if she would just give me one of her hands, there we go. I'll show you her manicure. So you could see that all of her claws are about the same length. And that means can she's a female. Can you lower that one bit? Yep, lower there we go, and then lower it. How's that? There you go, yep. Yeah. So all of her claws there on the front legs are about the same length. If she were a male, the middle claws would be about two or three times longer than the side claws. Huh. You can also tell by the length of her tail that she's a female and by how thick her body is. So males are much flatter and more compressed. Uh, so this is a female and she's been notched as number six. So I'll zoom in on the back of her shell. You can maybe see those tiny notches in the scoots. She's kicking a lot, so I don't know how well it's gonna fill up, but we've cut those just little tiny notches into the back of her shell. And those make a number combination so we can tell which individual she is and that we've seen her before. So these painted turtles are really well adapted for swimming. They're a very aquatic turtle. They're very flat, which helps them swim easily through the water. They are active hunters. So a turtle like this uh, eats mostly meat, which is probably insects in large part, but also small tadpoles, small fish, and uh, other sort of freshwater critters. They will occasionally take plant matter though. Uh, these turtles, they, we know they can live at least 40 years. Some of them can probably live even longer. Turtles on the whole are, are a very long lived group of animals. Uh, this turtle, if I had to estimate, she's probably, you know, 20, maybe a little more than 20 years old. So she's a good sized adult. She's definitely reproductively mature. She's probably laid eggs here before. So here's our, our wonderful painted turtle. I'm going to switch out for the other turtle we caught today. This is a snapping turtle. This is the baby, baby snapping turtle. Uh, this is not the smallest one I've ever seen, but it's pretty close. Very cute. Probably just hatched this year. Could be maybe a year or two old, depending on how much food it got in its first year. But uh, this, is, this is a baby snapping turtle. So you can see some differences right away looking at this turtle compared to the painted turtle we were just seeing, right? The color scheme is a lot duller, kind of just olive brown, green, gray. And the shell is really different. You can see the back of this shell is serrated. There's sort of a saw edge to the end of the shell, whereas the uh, painted turtle shell was smooth. And if you look at the plastron or the belly part of the shell, you can see the plastron on snapping turtles is very, very small. It's much reduced. So they've got a lot of room to move their arms, their legs, and especially their head and neck. Um, but their belly is not as well protected as a painted turtle's is. 
So snapping turtles make their living in a really different way from painted turtles, even though they live in the same sort of freshwater environments. Snapping turtles spend a lot of their time sitting on the muddy bottom of the water. So the, the, the pond bottom is actually what's usually protecting their belly. So they don't need as good armor plating on their stomach. And they're ambush predators. So where painted turtles will chase down and hunt their prey, snapping turtles will bury themselves in the mud. If people can see again, so I've yeah. got the snapping turtle still here, this, this baby snapping turtle. Um, and snapping turtles have kind of a, a tough reputation, but they're actually very gentle animals for the most part, especially in the water. So while snapping turtles are in the water, that's where they feel most comfortable. You never need to worry about going swimming or wading in water where there are snapping turtles because they just avoid people. They can see you coming and they'll just move away. The only time snapping turtles will bite people is when they're out of the water. That's when they're feeling vulnerable, they're out of their element, and they'll take snaps at people if, they, uh, if you start to harass a snapping turtle out of the water. So people often ask us, if I find a turtle that's crossing the road, especially a big snapping turtle, what should I do to help it? And what we say is, if you can safely do so, right? So if traffic isn't a danger to you, if the turtle isn't a danger to you, move the turtle off the road in the direction it's already facing. Don't try to bring it back to where it came from, because if you do that, as soon as you leave, the turtle's gonna turn around and try and cross the road again, right? The turtles know where they want to go. And unfortunately, we can't argue with them. They don't understand. So just bring it across in the direction it was already going uh, when you first found it. To safely pick up a snapping turtle, you want to avoid the front half of the shell because their necks are very long and flexible and they can bite pretty much anywhere on their front half. So you want to grab the back of the shell just like this. You can use your knuckles to control the rear feet so they can't claw or kick at you. Never ever pick a turtle up by the tail. Their tail is like it's long, it's kind of a tempting target but their tails are not designed to hold the full weight of their body and they can really damage their spinal cord if you try and hold them up by their tail. So that's my turtle handling safety tip. All right, so I'm gonna put this snapper back in the water. It's a little baby, but it's gonna get big one day. The biggest snapping turtle we've caught here at the Arboretum was 28 pounds. He was a big male. And we've also caught two females that we put radio trackers on so we'll be able to follow their movements and hopefully find their nests. We know because we're catching babies like this one that female snapping turtles are successfully nesting at the Arboretum. And we'd like to try and find those nests and protect them and maybe even take some of the baby turtles and head start them in local Boston schools. I run a lot of education programs in classrooms during the year. And we like to give baby turtles to give them a head start in classrooms. The kids get to learn about native wildlife the turtles get to put on a lot of weight and do a lot of healthy growing in a safe environment during their first year. And then we release them back into the wild just where they were caught. So it's a real win-win kind of program. And we're hoping we might be able to head start some baby turtles from the Arboretum in local Boston schools in the future. So I'm gonna put this turtle back and then I'll be ready to take some questions, Pam, if that's all right. Yeah. All right, super. So one question is how does a female painted turtle accommodate her eggs before they lay them. There's no, uh, they don't get a baby bump. <laughs> no, they don't get a baby bump, it's true. Although they do gain a lot of weight, as you might expect. So a turtle's shell actually has a fair bit of empty extra space inside it. So they need that extra space so that they can pull in their arms and legs to protect themselves if they feel like they're in danger. And what usually happens when a turtle becomes gravid or when a turtle is full of eggs is that they start filling up that empty space um, there's sort of a lot of extra loose skin. I can actually grab the painted turtle and maybe show you a little bit. It's harder to see on the painteds than on some of them, but. So you, you can see, if you look inside the painted turtle's shell, there's, I can easily get my finger in here. There's still like quite a bit of space between the outside of the shell and where her legs and the side of her body is. So that's the space that fills up. So they've got some built-in extra capacity, especially the females. Like I said, their shells are deeper than the males. So they've got that built-in extra space to expand into when they've got eggs ready to lay. Good question. So can you um, repeat, you talked about how do you tell the males from the females of the- Right. 
the painted, can you say that again for painted? Yeah, and so for, for, snapper. for painted turtles, if you could see her nails, I'm gonna try and hold her hand out so you can see it. Uh, so there are her claws, her front claws. They're all about the same length. If she were a male, then these front claws, the, the middle claws would be about two or three times longer than the, uh, the other claws around it. But since they're all about the same length, we know she's a female. Also, I can tell by the relative length of her tail and how thick she is when I hold her. That's something that just comes with experience. But those are how you tell male and female apart for painted turtles. Some other turtles, there are easier ways. Like in some turtles, the males will have a, a curve on the underside of their belly, which, help, which helps them balance when they're on top of a female in mating season. But that's not the case with painted turtles. And what about snappers? How do you? So for snappers, telling males and females apart is pretty difficult. Really, the only thing you can do is look at the distance from the, uh, the vent on the tail. So if you, if you take a snapping turtle's tail, I'm not gonna show you on the baby because it's not reproductively mature yet. You're not gonna be able to see it. But I can show you a little bit on the painted turtle. So you can see her vent there at the base of her tail. So where that is in relation to where her shell ends and how far down the tail it is, that's how you can tell uh, whether it's a male or a female in the snappers. And that's really the best way to do it. We're getting a, a, wise, a wise guy response saying, aren't the female snappers prettier? <laughs> you don't Maybe have to snappers, but I haven't been able to see any difference. <laughs> um, let's see, are muskrats predators of turtles? What was that? Are muskrats predators of turtles? Are muskrats predators? Absolutely, especially the baby turtles. Muskrats uh -huh. can eat a lot of baby turtles, almost anything. Even chipmunks will take baby turtles. Uh, if you think about it, you know, a, a baby turtle is just a nut. It's a hard covering with a bunch of protein inside and chipmunks are more than happy to catch them if they catch them out of the water and they'll chew right through those shells just like they would a nutshell. Hmm. Uh, but pretty much any small or mid-sized mammal will, is a predator for baby turtles. For adult turtles like this one, she's probably out of danger from muskrats, but there are still some predators like mink um, and even like larger turtles, big adult snapping turtles will also eat smaller turtles on occasion. And we see uh, great blue herons in the pond. Do those, do great blue herons also go for turtles, babies? Yes, they do. Great blue herons are big turtle predators. They like to eat baby turtles, but you know, at uh, this time of year, great blue herons, they're probably just fledging their youngsters, but their youngsters need to eat too. So sometimes baby turtles go to feed baby herons and, and that's the natural cycle. All right. Um, and is feeding bread beneficial or detrimental to turtles? Feeding bread. Sorry, what was that? Is feeding bread to the turtles detrimental or beneficial? Yeah, don't feed bread to turtles. It is not part of their natural diet. It isn't good for them. Most turtles are looking for a mostly protein diet. Uh, so fish, insects, and amphibians makes up most of our turtles' diets for the most part. Box turtles especially eat a lot of more plant matter than most of our other turtles, although they still eat a lot of slugs and other invertebrates and worms. Uh, yeah, don't feed bread to turtles. It's not good for them. And can you repeat what the snappers eat? So snapping turtles will eat pretty much anything that swims by them. If it moves in front of their face, they'll try to eat it unless it's big enough that they know they can't like a human. So they won't, they won't try to eat humans but pretty much anything that looks like it'll fit in their mouth, if it moves in their range of vision, they'll snap at it. Fish, mollusks, crustaceans, insects, birds. We've seen some snapping turtles take All right, so um, this is a good question, I think. So um, you talked about sometimes you take the baby turtles and they, you, they go and they get reared so that they have a better chance of surviving in the wild. Yeah. Um, yes. Are you disrupting any sort of mother-baby bonding or once the eggs hatch, the mother's job is done, is that true? Uh, well, actually it ends even before that. Once the eggs are laid, the mother's job is done. She does not attend the nest. Uh, female turtles bury their eggs, they dig a hole, they bury the eggs and then they leave and they never see them again. 
You know, they might run into their offspring incidentally if their offspring are in the same wetland as they are, but there is absolutely no parental care with these turtles at all. Uh, they hatch and they dig their own way out of the nest. Uh, so, and when you think about it, it's not a bad strategy because if the female were staying with the eggs, it would give away the location of the nest to predators. So really she's doing the best thing she can for them by burying them, hiding them, and then leaving the area. So that prevents the eggs from being found by things that would want to eat them. Um, how long do those eggs develop in females before they're laid? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, I think females are usually like, we can feel the eggs inside them, like they're that kind of gravid, usually for just a few weeks before they actually lay the eggs. The egg development process itself takes, I think, about a month and a half. I'm not 100% sure on that one, but I think from like actual, the start of egg development after mating to the time the eggs are ready to be laid, anywhere from a few weeks to several weeks. And they are capable of waiting. Most turtles will wait for good weather uh, so that they've got cover and that the soil is soft enough for them to dig in it. So they might wait for rain, which makes the soil a lot easier to work with. Just like kids building sandcastles at the beach, it's a lot easier to work with wet, uh, sort of substrate than with really dry substrate. So even if they're ready to lay, they might wait a week or more for the right weather to come out and lay their eggs. Okay, this is kind of a combo of why do snappers leave the water and go across a field or a road, which I think you've answered. It's, so they're go looking to lay their eggs, is that correct? Usually they're looking to lay their eggs, but if their pond is drying up, as we've seen here, we've seen a couple snappers that have moved from the ponds that are drying up into Dawson, into the bigger pond. So if their pond is drying up or if their food source has disappeared in their home pond, they'll go looking for a new home, just like any animal whose home has become unsuitable. Um, can you speak a little bit? I was watching a video that Brian Windmiller was talking in and um, I think it was around Great Meadows and you were putting screening over those nests. Yeah. And was that for Blanding's turtle, a different turtle than a snapper? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, Can those are Blanding's turtle nests. So Blanding's turtles are a threatened species in the state of Massachusetts. Um, so they're, they're protected by law and a lot of our programs at the Conservation Arms in New England are aimed at increasing Blanding's turtles numbers. So one of the things we do is we radio track the females, we find the nests, and then we protect the nests by putting those screens over them, which just prevents them from getting dug up by predators that might find them by smell. So that safeguards those eggs. And then when the eggs are about to hatch, we take the screen off, we dig up the eggs, we incubate the eggs in captivity, we hatch the babies, we head start them to give them the best chance of survival, and then we release them back where they hatch. All right. Um... What season do the eggs hatch? So most eggs hatch right about now, actually. We're sort of at the peak of hatching season for uh, wood turtles, landings turtles. Snapping turtles and painted turtles can get started a little easier, earlier rather. Their eggs are already hatching, have probably been hatching for the past month or so. But most turtles are laying their eggs in late May, June. June is the very busy season for laying. And then those eggs will incubate for four to six weeks, depending on temperature and a lot of other factors. And they'll often hatch in late July or early August. So right now is, is turtle hatching time. Okay. Uh, so we should be looking out for turtles and um, not running them over if we can help it and uh, letting them go whatever direction they're going in. Is that exactly. correct? Yep. So how do those um, hatchlings What's telling them where the water is? How are they sensing the direction of the water? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's a thing that we're still not 100% sure about, but we think there's a strong component of smell. We think they're using smell to find the nearby water and to, to follow the track. Uh, and also they're probably using kind of an eye for territory. So they know that water tends to gather in low places. So they'll head downhill, generally speaking, looking for places where water is likely to gather. But we think it's, it's largely smell is how they're finding their way to water. And can they, um, can turtles hear well? Uh, turtles can hear, sort of. Their sense of hearing is very different from ours. Uh, if you experienced what a turtle experiences, you might not call it hearing. Um, they do have eardrums, but their eardrums are, are under the surface of their skin. 
They have a layer of skin that covers their ears um, and they're pretty sensitive to vibration, uh, but they, they don't really hear air sound waves the same way we do, but they do have a vibration sense and they're capable of sensing things moving around them in a way that's pretty similar to our ear. Okay. Um, are the species temperature sensitive for hatching, male versus female? I guess sea, someone's saying sea turtles operate that way. Yeah, so it varies. Interestingly, it varies from species to species. So painted turtles, it does matter. Blanding's turtles, it matters. Higher temperatures will get you females. Lower temperatures will get you males. For snapping turtles, it's a bell curve with a peak in the middle. So if you get extreme values, I think you get males, middling values, you get females. And then for other turtles, like wood turtles, it's chromosomal. So they have a, a chromosome system like we do for sex determination. Great. And what, are you, what have you found so far about, well, A, what are the different types of turtles you found and what, what are the ranges of sexes that you've been able to determine? Yeah, so, so far it seems to be a pretty good gender balance. We found both males and females of all the species that we found here at the Arboretum. We found three turtle species, snapping turtles, painted turtles, and red-eared sliders. Red-eared sliders are an introduced species here in Massachusetts. They're not native. You find them usually in the central and southern U.S., but they're very popular in the pet trade. They were banned in the pet trade recently, but because turtles live so long and red-eared sliders can get quite large, a lot of people bought these turtles not realizing the lifetime commitment they were making. And then they take the turtles somewhere like the Arboretum in a pond and they just let them go. So we've got those introduced turtles in with our native turtles. We've only caught a few of them so far, but we've, we've caught more than one here. Um, we've caught more than 20 ind different individual painted turtles and more than a dozen individual snapping turtles that we've marked and released uh, across quite a good distribution of ages. We haven't seen any baby painted turtles yet, but that might just be because they haven't hatched yet this year. Oh, we found baby snapping turtles, so we definitely know that they're reproducing here at the Arboretum. And can you talk about how they make it through the winter? Yeah, so turtles are really amazing in the ways that they make it through the winter. Many turtles will winter at the bottom of a pond or a lake, even when it freezes over solid. Uh, painted turtles can in fact survive being frozen. Their blood has a natural antifreeze that keeps ice crystals from forming in their blood cells and causing them fatal damage. So they can survive below freezing temperature. Um, and because they're reptiles, their metabolism slows way, way down in the winter time. And they can get by with almost no oxygen and no food. So even though they breathe air just like we do, they can get by without a single breath of air for the entire winter because their metabolism drops down so very low during, during the winter time. That's pretty amazing. Um, if I put this, the slides up, if you can see them and talk about what we're seeing, that would be great. Yeah. So there lo looked like there was a long trap that has um, somewhat larger holes in it. I assume that's for turtles. That's for, yeah, the snapping turtles especially. We use the big turtles for the, the big traps for the big adult snappers. It's a okay. three foot diameter hoop trap. Okay, and then the smaller ones, what are you doing with minnows? So we're doing, we're putting out minnow traps, which are these much smaller sort of torpedo shaped traps that we've got out throughout the Arboretum. Mm -hmm. And we're using that sample for aquatic invertebrates and for small fish and amphibians. So we're seeing a lot of bullfrog tadpoles in those traps, um, a lot of goldfish in Dawson in the big pond, as well as brown bullhead and native catfish uh, in pretty much all of the ponds so far. And we found a remarkable variety of aquatic invertebrates. So we found diving beetles, we found back swimmers, we found giant water bugs, which are also called toe biters, which are a big sort of uh, true bug that are aquatic and have a pretty painful bite. Uh, we found fish fly larvae, uh, which are relatives of the sort of centipede looking things that people call helgromites that you'll mm -hmm. find in some fast flowing rivers. Uh, we found water scorpions, the genus Renatra, which are really fascinating sort of like aquatic stick insects with two raptorial claws like a scorpion that they can use to grab, uh, to grab prey, or like a mantis. Uh, we found a lot of creeping water beetles, uh, creeping water bugs, several other true bug species that you'll only see in freshwater habitats, uh, but quite a remarkable diversity of animals uh, just in these three ponds. Okay, great. So that's, that's the big snapper, right? Yeah, that's the, one of the big snappers we caught on the first day. 
I think that's the first female that we put a radio on. That's Brian holding her. And I'm going to point out, is he holding her incorrectly? You're not recommending people do that, right? So he's holding her in a way that we can only hold big snappers safely, okay. which is if you put your hand up above their head, you can use your knuckles to brace their head down so they can't bite you. Smaller snapping turtles, their necks are flexible enough that they might still be able to tag you. But for a turtle that big, that is a safe way of doing it. And it gives you a lot better control over the animal, which stops them from hurting themselves and stops them from getting loose. So for handling big snapping turtles, if you have the nerve for it, you come up from behind, curl your fingers around the front of the shell, use your knuckles to, to hold the head down away from your hand. Folks, don't try this at home. We're trained professionals. Brian knows what he's doing. But that is a way we use for, for big snappers that have lost some of that neck flexibility. And you can see that her head is being held down by Brian's fingers, which stops her from going back and biting him. Great. OK. So this looks like a turtle trap. Is that yep. right? Okay. Yeah, that's one of our middle middle sized turtle traps. So that's those are the kind we catch a lot of the painted turtles and the baby snapping turtles in. Mm -hmm. And minnow trap. Yep, that's a minnow trap. So those are the kind that are catching the small aquatic invertebrates, bullfrog tadpoles, that kind of thing. Okay. And that's a dried out pond with a turtle trap, correct? Yeah, one of our big traps. So you can see that pond was really drying up even when this photo was taken. And now it's pretty much just mud with a tiny trickle in the middle. Okay. And that's fairly normal. Someone had asked if that was normal for those two ponds to dry up. And it is fairly normal for those to get down to just mud in the summer, the heat of the summer. And is this you and Ashley checking yep. a trap? Yeah, so we're, we're taking up the trap. We use that stake to hold it in place so the traps don't float away. And you can see they've got a cut up piece of pool noodle inside that keeps the traps floating. So by keeping the traps floating, we ensure that any turtles who go into the trap always have access to breathable air because they need to come up and breathe air just like we humans do. Uh, so we pick up, we just pick the, the trap up just like Ashley's doing in this picture and see what's inside. You could probably see the sardine can that is the bait that we use for these turtles in there as well. And this is uh, notching a small turtle. Yep. So we, we're just using a file like you would file your nails. It's a triangular file. So we're just putting those little triangular notches in their rear scoots. Uh, you know, it's like being handled by humans is pretty much never a fun experience for wild animals. So I'm not going to say that they don't mind it, but I will say that it doesn't hurt them or injure them in any way. And we get it done as quickly as possible so that we can release them. And this is, do you measure their bellies or their shells? Yep, so we take a bunch of measurements from each turtle we catch. We measure the back part of their shell, the carapace. We measure the stomach part, the plastron. We measure their width and we measure their depth, so how thick the turtles are. And we record all of those things to get a good idea of their body size. And then this is, is this that's a painted point. turtle? This is my last slide, I believe. I think that's a red-eared slider. Oh, okay. The red-eared sliders and painted turtles are closely related. They both have those yellow stripes on their face, but you can see this is really quite a hefty turtle. Like that one's Big Mac size, you know? And if you look just behind her eye, you can see a tiny bit of that red that gives the red-eared sliders their name. Okay, wonderful. Um, let me just check to see if we have any last questions and then I'm gonna let you get back to your job here. Um, Part of it. <laughs> that's right, educator, communicator. Um, ah. So with many schools being remote this fall, is your conservation program, your high, it's a high school rearing program or middle school rearing program, um, is that in danger? Uh, you, we're still, everything is, is very much in motion. We're trying to figure out ways that we can provide the program as safely as possible. Obviously schools that aren't meeting in classrooms, they're not gonna be able to have classroom turtles but we still wanna provide what kind of outdoor education opportunities we can. So we're looking at providing virtual programs just like this one to students who aren't in classrooms. Uh, and for classrooms that are open, we're figuring out ways that we can make sure the turtles are transferred safely, minimizing contact from outside people, um, and just trying to be as mindful as we can of the student's health. 
Uh, but you know, everything's really in flux right now. So it's hard to say what the program is gonna look like this year, but we are already in the process of recording multimedia and planning virtual field trips for uh, as, many, as many classrooms as we can provide those for. Great. Um, do you remove the non-native turtles? Uh, no, we don't. Uh, there's not really anything good to do with them uh, in terms like, you know, killing them isn't really fair. Like they didn't ask to be here. And red-eared sliders here in Massachusetts, it doesn't get warm enough for long enough for their eggs to hatch successfully. So we're not worried about them starting a big invasive population. We're just sort of letting them live out their retirement here at the Arboretum uh, in sort of quiet relaxation. And that problem will eventually take care of itself. That's a pretty good deal for those turtles, I think. <laughs> I, I think so, but I want to reiterate, please don't release pet turtles into the wild. It can introduce diseases into wild populations. And, you know, with only three or four sliders we've caught here, it's not a huge deal. But even if one person thinks, ah, I'll just, it, it can't hurt that much. Like, it doesn't take many, and suddenly you've got 30 non-native turtles all fighting with native turtles for the same pond. They'll eat all the food. It'll be a bad picture. So please, please do not release pet turtles into the wild. Great. And do turtles carry salmonella? Yes, they can. Uh, when we say that turtles carry salmonella, we don't mean that they're constantly sick with salmonella, like if you've ever been infected by salmonella, but it can live on their skin. It can live in their mucous membranes. And so if you handle a turtle, if you don't wash your hands and then you touch your own mucous membranes, you can pick up salmonella from the turtle and get yourself sick. That's true with a lot of wild fish and reptiles. Always wash your hands before eating or touching your face, especially in these times. That's just good advice in general. Uh, but you had, you're not at risk for catching salmonella just for being near a turtle or being in the same room as a turtle. It's not that kind of contagious disease. Just wash your hands after you handle them. I always use hand sanitizer. You know, be smart. Great. I think we're going to wind it up right there. Um, be smart. Be careful. Enjoy the turtles. Mm -hmm. And don't turn them around. <laughs> right. Right? All right. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Matt. And thank you to your whole team for doing this project at the Arboretum. Take care. Thank you to do it. Thank you all so much for having us on this turtle model. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.